So our first speaker in the afternoon is Professor Val Spreber from New York University in Abu Dhabi. His topic is cyclic loop spaces where hair topple theory in high energy physics. Let's welcome the speaker. Thank you very much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. It's great to speak here. Right, so this conference is on loop spaces and I will be speaking about their cyclic version. This is um, an article we're finalizing with Hisham Sati here at New York University in Abu Dhabi. I haven't prepared a slide. What I have is a um, nice introduction to this article that we're writing. I'll just slowly go through the formulas in this introduction and show some things. And please feel free um, to ask questions whenever you like. So, so it's a familiar construction, of course, that um, on the free loop space of anything really, but let's consider it for um, a topological space calligraphic X here for a moment, where it's given by the mapping space of maps from the circle, and I'll denote by the smooth circle, uh, smoothest meant to uh, distinguish it from the groupoid BZ, which will appear later. So this is the topological circle for our purposes at the moment. And this mapping space of all maps from the circle into a topological space X is, of course, it's the free loop space, free because the, the loops are not required to um, stick to a given base point. And now that space, of course, has in particular a rotation action by the um, circle group S1 acting on itself by pre-composition on these maps. And uh, using that action, one can form um, not just the quotient, but um, the homotopy meaningful version of that quotient, which I denote by this double slash line. So this double slash is, as we're talking about um, topological spaces, as long as we're talking about them, it is, uh, you can think of it as being notation for the Borel construction where we um, take the product space of this mapping space with some universal classifying space for S1 actions, and then take the ordinary quotient of that product. But uh, the homotopy um, quotient is the, the generally homotopy meaningful version of this. And of course, so these spaces, spaces of this form um, have been of interest uh, specifically in applications to elliptic homology since a long time going back or much of the interest arose in 1988 when Witten argued that we're to think of these um, free loop spaces as being configuration spaces of closed strings that move around on this topological space and who argued that the S1 equivariant with respect to this action, the S1 equivariant K theory of the loop space, um, first of all, is the partition function or related to the partition function of the heterotic string on the target space. And moreover, um, as was understood then, is some kind of elliptic genus of that topological space. So um, terminology varies um, ever since this origin of the construction of string theory. Some authors, notably in string topology, call this the string space. Uh, Witten himself didn't refer to the somatic quotient directly, as far as I can see. Uh, he called that mapping space, that free loop space for the case that X itself was actually a quotient, an orbifold target for a string. The quotient of a topological space X by a finite group actually called it the, the twisted loop space, where this word twist unfortunately has nothing to do with twisted commodity. It's, it's string theoretic terminology for twisted sectors, which is um, stuff that appears if you look at strings and orbifolds. So there was no, as far as I know, no really standard terminology for this space. But one can notice that if X here is a simply connected topological space, then there's a theorem by Jones which is the analog of familiar theorems in algebraic geometry, which says that then the ordinary cohomology of these homotopy quotient free loop spaces is actually the cyclic cohomology of the original space X. And that motivated us some time ago when we started running into these things um, in the analysis of brain charges and string theory, we, we started calling these spaces cyclic spaces or the cyclified loop space or the cyclification. And I should say that this rhymes very much on the now standard terminology in stable homotopy theory, where people look at the suspension spectrum of this mapping space equipped with this S1 action, and then recalling in a fine-grained way this S1 action as an action on spectra. And that makes that makes for cyclotomic spectrum. Sorry, I keep switching here. Okay. So anyway, so it's I'm gonna be concerned with these cyclic um, loop spaces. And the in themselves, there's nothing much um, like in the definition, which needs discussion, even though there are rich spaces. And I should maybe amplify at this point, which is going to become important that, of course, um, 
already in Witten's application or specifically there, um, even though one starts out talking about this full loop space, in the end, one takes a curiously strong limit where one is effectively just looking at the essentially constant loops. Um, the whole point being that one somehow remembers this, this circle action. So there's a subtle point here that that limit is actually not empty. It has some non-trivial um, structure retained in it. And that limit is actually the one that one cares about specifically as one goes talking about this in the actual context of orbifolds, which is the, the context I want to look at now. So if, as was the original motivation, Bitten's article origin, originally, if if our topological space X here has a structure of a manifold, which is acted on smoothly or at least continuously, we can talk about this um, in the continuous context, um, then of course it has much more structure than just being, um, you know, just a topological space or just a Borel construction, then we can regard it as a as an orbifold, meaning as a manifold in the higher geometry, if you wish, of um, smooth spaces or topological spaces that may have automorphisms. Uh, on them, um, also known as, as stacks, different differentiable or topological stacks. So the question that got us started with this project here is uh, was an old question in um, elliptic homology to which uh, Shenhuan, our host, contributed um, in a substantial manner, but it goes back uh, many years ago to work, I think, by Nora Ganta, um, where the question was, um, what would be the analog of this construction of the cyclic loop space construction as we actually lift everything to the context of orbifolds and stacks. So if we're not just talking about um, topological spaces, but about geometric structures with these group automorphisms on them. And what I'm drawn here is kind of a rev revisionistic version, which is not the way it appeared in the literature. But the point is, well, if we imagine that we do have a good theory of orbifolds and stacks. If we do have um, geometric topology of uh, differential topology of um, orbifolds and stacks, then we would envision that if the theory works well, we can just write down the evident analog of the previous formula and have it still make sense come out as an actual orbifold or, or maybe more general stack to us. So we, we envision that if we can form X mod G as the global quotient orbifold that it is, um, that there should be a mapping stack or loop um, stack. I, I write smooth here. The, whole, the same thing can always be done in uh, either in the topological or in the smooth uh, context of, of stacky maps from the circle into it, which is um, more interesting than the usual topological maps. These stacky maps pick up exactly what Witten would call the, the twisted sectors. And then somehow homotopy quotient that whole thing in the category of stacks. And then moreover, and this is really where um, the meat is of this discussion, we would somehow say, okay, and now we want to restrict inside that cyclic stack, cyclified orbifolds, we want to restrict in there to the essentially constant loops, those namely, which um, do not traverse any actual distance in X, but which may change these twisted sectors. So which may kind of jump around along these re-identifications that are given by the G action. And, um, it is familiar um, from component constructions that such loops can be understood, of course, as being maps of stacks of, of geometric group points from the de-looping group point of the integers, which I'm denoting by BZ here. So this is the group point with a single object and Z worth of automorphisms of this object. And homing this, I mean, it's, I need to actually prove something here, but it's intuitively clear that homing this into an orbifold, which consists of a bunch of cohesively connected points, some of which are related by such such transformations, has to pick one point with such an automorphism. So it has to pick an essentially constant loop that is, uh, which really sits at a point, but may change that twisted sector. So this is what one expects, and a working theory of stacks should just make it happen. Um, what happened uh, in history was that, that Nora Gante was taking hints from elliptic homology, which told her what um, such a cyclified infinitesimal loop stack should look like. And she deduced certain conditions, rotating condition, others, and made educated guesses on what the right model for this object on the left here is. As far as I understand, this was partially successful. Then I think uh, Charles Resch may have made some um, uh, suggestions. And finally, um, Xenuan gave um, what is now the accepted definition of the, uh, I think she calls it the extended inertia group point. Um, 
yeah, which I'm recalling further down in this document, but which, which maybe for the present purpose doesn't need to concern us. It's a component definition that in itself is uh, rather ingenious. One needs to some inspiration to come up with this. It's not entirely obvious how to find it, which is why it took some years to obtain it. And what got us started here on this project is the statement that, um, first of all, and I'll come to this now, there is a good context in which one can make sense of all these constructions and orbifolds and stacks. And second, we prove, and it's a, it's a non-trivial proof. I mean, it's not, anyway, so it's not, not immediate, one needs to work. We prove that this canonically given construction, which I'll explain a bit now, actually is equivalent in the correct notion of equivalence of stacks to um, one's extended inertia orbifold. Which means, or will mean, that all the constructions one does in quasi-elliptic cohomology with these um, with these stacks have kind of guaranteed good properties that come from the general stacky theory. And some of these I will um, explain now. So here's an indication. I need to make some room on my screen here to see what I'm showing. Okay. So here's an indication of how we approach this. This is a topic um, that some of um, the people in the audience may well be familiar with, but uh, for instance, yesterday in the question session, after Zebra and Bung's talk, there were some questions relating to this point. So maybe it's worthwhile just um, recalling some basics here. So what we're really doing when we're looking at these um, orbifolds in, in this very good um, higher stacky context, we're um, kind of proceeding along this old story that goes back to um, the Steinrod about passing to ever more convenient, in quotation marks, and in the technical sense, ever more convenient context for doing differential topology. So it was noticed early on by Hurevich actually in the, in the late 50s already, that um, passing from just the category of all topological spaces to those that are compactly generated, these open subsets are detected uh, by mapping compact house of spaces into them, that retains essentially everything you may ever want from a category of topological space spaces while making it um, what in category theory would be called Cartesian closed, namely making it having the good property of having mapping spaces. In general, in, for general topological spaces, you can always form what looks like a mapping space, but it will have the expected properties of behaving like a mapping space only under some um, local compactness conditions. And um, in this, this category of um, Compactly generated topological space, all this is built in. Mapping spaces exist. And ever since, um, these categories really are the foundation for everything that is done with points at topology and algebraic topology. But it turns out this is not the end of the story. There is a sequence of sort of ever more convenient versions of topological spaces. So the next one has been called by some authors um, the very convenient category, building, you know, as a pun on or as a, a variation of Stenhouse's already uh, original convenient category of um, uh, the topological delta generated or numerical uh, topological spaces, which are those um, whose open subsets are detected by mapping RNs into them, by mapping Euclidean spaces into them. And uh, a curious um, result, which was proven some years ago, is that uh, these D topological spaces, and that's where it gets really interesting for um, applications, uh, for many applications, specifically in physics, where the topological spaces are mostly or always some are underlying smooth differential structures. Turns out this very convenient category of D topological spaces um, is actually fully faithfully embedded into the category of diffeological spaces, which is a um, category that was originally invented as a category that generalizes the category of smooth manifolds to a context where uh, more constructions exist, such as uh, all, all fiber products and all quotients. So diffeological spaces for the experts is a uh, concrete sheaves on the side of Cartesian spaces, which was already mentioned yesterday. So the idea is that one passes to ever more general now, uh, since this is an embedding here, a full embedding, ever more general notions of space, where um, there's more spaces than one might have originally thought to be interested in. The point being though, that on the spaces in which one is definitely interested in, all constructions exist in the nice and expected ways so that we can apply the constructions, everything will behave as it should, which is exactly the kind of problem we were starting with. Like we want to ask, okay, what does it mean to take the cyclic loop space of anything really, say of an orbifold? And then the formalism tells us exactly what it should be if it exists. And then we can check after the fact um, if that thing that just exists now has the properties that one hopes it has, if it's still smooth and singularity free or, or maybe not, and then it's not. So that is the, um, that is the intuition between passing to this diffological space. And curiously, so that even though these generalized smooth manifolds, they also include topological spaces with you know, continuous maps between them 
in this guise of the topological space. Well, once one is at this point, um, one is really prepared to go into the world of uh, higher differential geometry by saying, well, um, on top of everything being not probable by Cartesian spaces, thus reflecting some differential or topological aspects, we can also um, ask for higher um, higher symmetries on these things. So we can ask, uh, think of these as sheaves, that to a given Cartesian space, they don't just assign a set of ways of um, sending that given Cartesian space into our would-be space, but a groupoid of maps, reflecting the fact that our, the space we're describing may have automorphisms like an orbifold does. Okay, long story short, um, there is uh, now the category of uh, not just uh, sheaves of sets on Cartesian spaces, but sheaves of, of infinity groupoids, for instance, modeled as Kahn complexes, and with the right notion of um, uh, of weak equivalences between the, these, one finds a category of what are called smooth infinity groupoids, which are like smooth or differential topological spaces that have um, automorphisms like orbifolds do or may have. But these automorphisms may have automorphisms, automorphisms, and so higher, ever higher up um, at infinitum. So this smooth infinity group, what is for the experts, is the infinity troubles over the side of Cartesian spaces. It's good open covers between them equivalently. Uh, equivalently, it's the um, infinity troubles over the side of all smooth manifolds with open covers between them. Now, the point of this yoga here is that not just can we, I mean, you can say, okay, great, you can, of course, generalize all you want. But are we still talking about the constructions that we were interested in? The, the point of this diagram here, which is meant to be a homotopy commutative diagram, is that yes, that is the case. Um, here's um, what I call infinity group points, which is really so the pi zero of this, the, 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 the homotopy category of this is the classical homotopy category of topological spaces of the CW complex structures and homotopy classes of maps between them. So infinity group points is the sort of derived version of this, where we say, um, we don't just um, identify homotopy class of maps, but we consider all maps, all homotopies, and all higher, higher homotopies between them. So this is, if you wish, topological spaces with the structure of CW complexes with uh, maps, higher homotopies of maps, and so forth between them. So this is the base types of which classical homotopy theory takes place, where there's no geometry, really, where the topological spaces are, are just um, a stand in for the homotopy types, namely for the singular simplicial complexes, if you wish, for their path infinity group points, which they represent. The point now is that from all these categories, we have underlying functors that produce underlying homotopy types here. So the familiar one, the, the classical ones from what now almost 100 years ago or more, is the one that takes the topological space to its singular simplicial complex, which, um, or maybe to itself, even if you apply the right quillen. Uh, equivalences, which is the underlying path infinity group, whatever. That construction uh, extends or just immediately restricts actually to k-topological and d-topological spaces. It also generalizes to diffeological spaces in the evident way that you say, well, on simply C's, you can certainly have um, smooth structure. Simply C's as uh, subspaces of our ends inherit, for instance, the structure of manifolds with boundaries. You don't even need the boundaries anyway. You can certainly uh, ask for smooth maps from simply C's into a space that has smooth structure as these typological spaces have. Doing this gives another simplicial set, which from proofs is equivalent actually, for instance, if the typological space came from a topological space to them and so forth. And so all of these categories have this underlying infinity path, we'll put construction, which we end up calling um, for historical and other reasons, the shape construction. So shape is supposed to, um, you know, invoke this intuition that the topological topological space or manifold itself is, is a geometric structure, which which is very fine grained. As you just remember its underlying homotopy type, you just see, you, you know, you forget the smooth structure, but you still see its shape. The, the key example is the circle, which will concern us a whole lot, which is, of course, as a manifold, is a, is a smooth thing. As, a, as you um, take to its, uh, pass to its homotopy type, all you really know is, well, is this thing with a hole in the middle? That's really all the homotopy type remembers for you, the fact that you have a non-trivial pi one of this space. So in this sense, you should think of this as being the shape operation. And uh, yeah, the upshot is just here. Sorry, I switch pages again. The upshot is just that, um, that uh, these categories exist. And um, 
yeah, we have we have some monographs here where I mean, much of this or most of this is, is really well known by now. But there's some monographs here, um, which you can find on the archive, equivalent principle, infinity bundles, and proper orbifold cohomology, where we lay out all the background material that I'm invoking in the following and working with these structures. So, so let's dwell on this shape operation just a bit more because this will really drive um, much of the circularification of orbifold. So. One way of several, this is actually not the first one that was written down. This is not the first one that I used when I set this up in, in 2013. Um, I tried to make this work and couldn't, but later, luckily, Dmitry Pavlov made this formula work, which is the expected formula. So let me go through this. So it says, this is one way. It says that if you have some uh, smooth infinity stack X, which you're invited to think of as, for instance, it might just be a manifold, a smooth manifold, or it might be an orbifold, or it might be something wilder then one way of presenting the shape of it is to say, well, let's consider the simplicial um, object, the collection of all mapping stacks from the n simplices regarded as smooth simplices, as smooth spaces, into x. So this is just, this is a variant of this loop stack construction that we just saw a few minutes back, where we um, smoothly map, uh, now not uh, the circle, but simplices into x. And we can form the mapping stack, um, for all of these ends, and um, this behaves well in, in both of its variables. So this forms a simplicial object, and we can take this innocent symbol as the homotopy co-limit of this system of mapping stacks. What it does intuitively is that it amalgamates all these simplices in the way which is directly analogous. In fact, it's the same principle of the way that the, the singular simplices in a basic topological space form the singular simplicial complex of that space which is a simplicial set. In the same way here, we form um, um, sort of this simplicial construction in stacks, and that really is the shape. So that formula makes manifest that this construction is a direct analog of the path infinity construction from topological spaces, just that we um, uh, embed it all into, the, into this world of um, infinity stacks now. What this construction, uh, one advantage this construction has is that it immediately tells you the maybe most important um, property of the shape construction for the present purpose, namely that it has a unit map. So this comes from the fact that the terminology comes from the fact that shape turns out to be a monad. It's actually an idempotent monad on this infinity category, um, which means that in particular, so the idempotency means there is a product, which however, a multiplication, which however is, is actually uh, uh, collapses to a triviality, but what does, remain is this unit map, which tells you that any that there's a natural transformation that takes any, that's, that maps every smooth infinity stack to its shape. And the way to think about it is simply, if we do understand the shape as by this formula here, as being the higher path infinity group out of X, then this is just the inclusion of the constant paths. It sends uh, every point, we should say maybe generalized point of these stacks, just to the, the higher path constant on this. So this construction, uh, it's really important for what follows, and that is the intuition you should have. There's other um, models when we actually compute later on, when we compute that we actually reproduce once extended um, inertia group port, we use another model for the shape operation. It's also the operation, um, it's also the unique functor that preserves homotopy co-limits and which sends our ends, so Euclidean spaces, to the point, right? So the fundamental infinity group out of a Euclidean space, its shape is just the same is that of a point because there is no non-trivial homotopy in a Euclidean space. And for computations, for many computations, that is the useful characterization of the shape operation um, by the fact that all of these are stacks on Cartesian spaces um, by a version of uh, the standard fact that every sheaf is the co-limit of representables. We know from abstract on abstract grounds that actually all these possibly very complicated smooth infinity stacks are just amalgamations of the smooth RNs or in a, in a possibly complex way, there are co-limits over representables. And so that means if, if I have a specific co-limit representation of my stack as a co-limit over Rns, then I can just apply the shape operation uh, to each component of the simplicial thing, contract all, all the Rns to a point, get a simplicial set, and regard that now as a geometrically constant infinity stack, that will be its shape. Okay, that's just as a side remark, that's how we actually compute these things. So. The example of this construction that um, uh, is, first of all, maybe the first non-trivial example, the simplest non-trivial example, but also the only one 
the, the key one that drives our discussion here, we can generalize later, but this uh, first non-trivial example already carries a lot of interesting structure with it, is the shape of the circle. So I, I write this S1 smooth here to mean the, the circle with its structure as a zero truncated but cohesive stack. So it's, it's really the circle as a smooth manifold, Uneda embedded into stacks, as opposed to its shape, which is often what is called the circle in homotopy theory, and is exactly the ability to, to distinguish these two incarnations of the circle that is important here. So as we take the circle as a smooth manifold, form its shape, well, the shape, um, as, as we just mentioned, but let me just highlight again, it kind of recalls, oh, the circle is connected, so there's a single object, oh, and then it says, oh, but it has a Z worth of automorphisms of this object coming from the winding number of loops around the circle that start and end at this point. So this gives the orbifold, if you wish, or the stack ever, whatever, uh, which is the point homotopy quotient by Z, which is the same thing by definition of notation, essentially, as uh, what we will call BZ, the classifying stack or moduli stack of the integers. It's a big name for a simple construction, but important construction. So to amplify on the right here, since everything happens in smooth stacks, where both differential geometry and higher homotopy are merged, we, we see two different extremes here of the same of the same kind of notion, right? On the left is a is an ordinary manifold that is not stacky in the sense it's, it's not, it doesn't have group portal direction. There's no non-trivial automorphisms here. This is just an ordinary manifold, the circle. On the right, the geometry has vanished. This thing is um, discrete in the geometric sense. It has no geometric um, structure. It's discrete in the sense of the discrete topological space is discrete. Like all maps from Rn into it are constant, but it does have non-trivial automorphisms, namely Z. And both of these uh, are incarnations of the circle. And it's the shape unit, um, as one can convince oneself, that relates the two. So this is a very basic fact. Oh, sorry, I was pointing at a very basic fact in, in modern language. The point now is that given that it's a natural transformation of stacks, we now immediately have access to all the machinery of universal um, constructions in any infinity topos. And so we can form exactly what we want to form. So um, maybe the important um, diagram is the one on the left here. Um, we can form the mapping stack now out of BZ into X, which remember is what we expect to be the infinitesimal, well, it's the inertia stack of X the, to be thought of as the essentially constant loops in X. We can homotopy quotient that. So BZ, that's the point now. S1 was a, it was a group under the ordinary um, circle group action, but BZ is still a group in the category of stacks as well. It's called a two group. So the fact that the circle um, has group structure or any any group structure on an infinity stack is respected by the shape operation because it preserves finite products. Uh, I didn't mention this before, but it does preserve finite products and homotopy co-limits, and that is enough to preserve group structure. And um, so it turns out also this BZ has group structure, as such it's called the two group because it's a group or with group structure. And so we can ask for homotopy quotienting. And this is where things get a bit subtle, where one really needs the machinery. I mean, it's not super subtle. This is well understood, but. But this is where one, one really needs some understanding of higher geometry in order to start making sense of these things. So here we're now forming a multiple quotient by the action, not of an ordinary group, but of a two group. And so um, the same construction, oh, sorry, not the same. And so we can now ask um, here about um, pulling this construction back along the delooping of the, of the shape map. So, so we, can, we can ask, well, if, if S1 had group structures, there's a moduli stack for circles, which is denoted by this B operation. But, but then on the left, this gives us the moduli stack of the moduli stack of the integers. And the unit operation deloops and produces canonical map. And this pullback, you see, well, by some general nonsense, by the theory of principal affinity bundles, really, which we lay out in these articles that I pointed to, one finds that this pullback is of this form changes the group that acts. It's really the, the extension of the action through this homomorphism. So this, pull, this homotopy pullback construction does what you naively expect should be possible. If you have a space with this group action and you have a group homomorphism from here to this group, you should be able to build a space with that group action by precomposing the action with that map. This is what this homotopy pullback does. And so this is our candidate here for um, 
what should be the extended inertia or before this is what we prove is equivalent to um Hans construction and also this other diagram is supposed to indicate which needs a bit more discussion than i really have uh, time and room for here in this introduction this needs some adjunction business one finds that there is also this canonical as expected this canonical comparison map to the full cyclic loop stack um, where we uh, don't just home bz we don't just home the shape of the circle into x but we home the actual circle into x so yeah so this will be if you go through the article this will be thing this just exists and it has all the abstract properties so if one could turn time back to what now 15 years ago or something and say okay what could possibly be the um the cyclic version of an orbifold we would say well it has to be this so that's probably what it is that turns out to be the right answer um i want to amplify here that it's kind of nice and fun to observe that this kind of subtle business of passing to essentially constant loops which really drives all this construction of elliptic homology ever since witten's construction is all encoded by the shape unit these these Whereas this is a finite loop in the evident sense that it traces out finite distance in any cohesive space. This is in a way just an infin infinitesimal loop. It's still the circle, but that loop by its, by its discrete but higher geometric nature can only traverse um, uh, loops that are themselves kind of of group portal nature, which are only the, the twistings, uh, the, the changes of twisted sectors in an orbifold. Okay, long story short. Um, Let's go further. So, so I don't want to go here. I have in this the mo the bulk of this document is the proof that this is the expected component construction. I don't want to go through this proof here in the talk because it's just that well, it's a technical thing. But the the document is up. I think you can find the if you if you follow the links in the in the abstracts anyway. Otherwise, you can find it on my webpage. Um, but what I do want to do is now I do want to point out um, what we gain. Um, so the point, the, the claim now is, well, we have this abstract formulation of uh, the extended inertia orbifolds. Does it give us anything? Do we learn anything? And uh, I think we learn a whole lot, and I want to um, amplify this a bit. In order to amplify this, I just uh, make one step back to um, some background on understanding uh, cohomology in the context of higher stacks. So what I want to get to is the the formula for transgression, which is important also in elliptic cohomology, one wants to say, okay, given some orbifold like X mod G here, we want to be uh, considering the situation that there are certain cohomology classes on that orbifold. And uh, then as we pass to the cyclification of this orbifold, these cohomology classes should induce certain cohomology classes on the cyclification by a process that in special cases is known as transgression. Uh, it's the transgression operation in, in group cohomology, for instance, but it, it should generalize it to other situations. And in order to see how this comes out very nicely now, I'll, I just briefly um, put the notion of cohomology as such into the context of these higher stacks. So I guess you're familiar with the fact um, that goes by the name Brown's representability theorem or, um, uh, yeah, that name it goes by, uh, which says that um, among among what is called generalized, but which I would call ordinary generalized cohomology theories, namely those that satisfy the, the whitehead generalization of the Eilenberg Steinrod axioms. So, cohomology theories like ordinary cohomology, K theory, elliptic cohomology, cohomotopy, and so forth, stable cohomotopy, all these um, are, as you may know, represented by a space or actually by a spectrum of spaces, in that um, maybe I actually have the example next year, I should show this. Right. So, for instance, the ordinary cohomology uh, with coefficients in some abelian group is represented by a space, which in my funny notation here, um, so ordinarily it's called an eilenberg maclean space, and then written K-A-N. I write this B to the N-A uh, because it's the n-fold de-looping of the abelian group. I'm assuming the abelian group is, is discrete just for uh, just to cut, the, cut some corners. All this can be generalized. And then, so the point is, there's some homotopy type here, such that the homotopy class of maps into that from our given orbifold, that the set of homotopy classes is the cohomology set. So this means the cohomology uh, set on the left, cohomology group is represented by this space in the sense of the unit dilemma, uh, in that um, every cohomology class is the equivalence class of maps into that space. And um, that is um, in ordinary context, um, this situation fails for richer non homotopy invariant cohomology theory. So if you if you take some chief cohomology, for instance, if you take uh, 
differential cohomology, uh, Deline cohomology, it is not represented by a spectrum, not by a bare spectrum. It's not represented by a spectrum that carries no geometry, since there are cohomology theories that depend not just on the amount of type, but, but on the actual geometry of your target space. But now, as the name already suggests, sheaf cohomology is something that actually does have representable objects inside sheaf toposes. And so it turns out that essentially any reasonable notion of cohomology that people ever have ever written down, covering vast arrays of examples, um, are of the form that they're actually equal to a homotopy class of maps from a given object in a given infinite topos to a given moduli stack. So um, for instance, uh, let's see, which examples do we care about? So all um, Hopkins and Singer in what, 2005 or something noticed that differential generalized cohomology theories can be built by taking a moderate fiber product of bare spectrum as a sort of in homotopy, bare homotopy types with uh, sheaves of differential forms with rich coefficients, which a priori live in very different categories. One lives in the homotopy category of spaces, the other lives maybe in the category of sheaves or manifolds, but both of these contexts are unified inside, for instance, the smooth infinity, the infinite topos of smooth infinity stacks that I uh, described. And in there, um, one can form this homotopy fiber product, call it A, and then declare that maps into that are co cycles for differential cohomology theories. Okay, long story short. So in infinity topos theory, essentially every cohomology theory becomes representable by some moduli stack so that cohomology is maps into this. But this means, since we just constructed the cyclification on orbifolds and on more general things as an affinity factor, we constructed it as a natural construction using just mapping stacks and homotopy quotients on which are functorial. This means that without doing any further work now as, a, as, a, as an upshot here, we know that cyclification, first of all, it applies to objects much more general than orbifolds. It applies in particular also to general moduli stacks. We can just hit such a system of maps and homotopies with the cyclification infinity functor, and we know that right away on the cyclification of any orbifold, um, there is then induced a cohomology, a, a co cyclic coefficients in the cyclified um, moduli stack. So this is something that really hasn't, I think, received any attention before. It's still the same idea that you just hop, hom the circle into something in a stacky way and homotopy quotient out the circle action on itself. But now A can be rather general. It can be, for instance, the um, the sheaf of spectra representing a differential cohomology theory or one of its component spaces. Okay, so this is an abstract construction. Here comes one uh, kind of not completely abstract ingredient, which one needs to fit in, which is a very cool uh, fact. And namely, it's the following. Um, it serves also as a good example for what the cyclified uh, moduli stacks can be. Let's consider this for the case we um, just had above where A, is the n-fold de-looping of an ordinary discrete abelian group. So suppose we're looking at the case of ordinary cohomology and kind of the strategy will be, even if we have a very rich cohomology theory, we'll always be interested into um, asking for characteristic classes from it into ordinary cohomology with which we can detect its main features. Even if it's richer, there's kind of always shadows in ordinary cohomology that we're interested in. So this is uh, not a mood exercise here to look at this example. And the first one finds is that the cyclification of such an einberg mclean space, which for me is, uh, you know, written BN plus 1A, first of all, one shows that the cyclification of this has a following pleasant or concrete form. It's actually the product space of the original guy and a copy of it um, with N shifted down at degree by one. This kind of the space, if you think about it, this is the space of based loops in here, whereas this you should think of being the um, space of base points. So what this really says is that as we form the free loop space of an einberg mclean space, due to the abelian nature, we can actually do what we otherwise can never do. We can kind of decompose a free loop. We can say, well, the free loop is like a based loop and the choice of base point. In, in general, I mean, this is sort of locally true, but you can't disentangle it globally. For an abelian de-looping here, one can disentangle this globally. And moreover, one can check what is the resulting S1 action. It's kind of, yeah, it's a bit subtle to describe. So in, in a way, it, it leaves these loops alone because they don't change, but it, but it does move the base point around. The upshot just being that um, it turns out that you can actually take out this shifted copy. You can take that out of the homotopy quotient. There's a map which goes back to BNA and it, it recovers 
the BNA in the sense that there was this canonical map that sends BNA first into this product and then into the quotient. So you might think, well, now we have quoted it. It's, it's, it's gone. It no longer, it's demolished. Now it no longer looks like, like it used to. But the, the statement here is no, you can re-extract it. You can't re-extract this factor, but this factor you can re-extract. So this means that inside the simplification of, of an Nabila and Eilenberg lane space, we can recover the shifted copy. And as one goes through it, we'll see this in examples now. This has this very curious interpretation of being the operation of loop integration, right? So remember the cyclic space is, yeah, it's a space of free loops. You don't care about um, how the loops are kind of rotated. And now you say, well, let me just sort of average over these loops. That is a good way of thinking about what this does as we see in the examples. Okay, so that was the ingredient. I'll now come to the punchline what we gain from this. So remember two things. Cyclification was an infinity functor, so we can just hit all our diagrams with cyc, and we have this projection out of the cyclification of an abelian uh, classifying stack. From this, we can now form the following diagram, and I claim this is transgression in group cohomology. So suppose we have a, a discrete group here, so a group in sets all embedded into our infinite topos, and suppose we're looking at what the delooping of that group, but for the purposes of what we're after here, you should think of this as being a one orbifold singularity with G automorphisms inside some orbifold. That's how this arises in applications. So suppose we've zoomed in and some orbifold it has a singular point, which has G worth of automorphisms, right? as a fixed point of some G action. And we want to ask what is the orbifold cohomology sort of at that point. So we, I've always said before, if we're asking for ordinary cohomology, we're asking for this map of stacks from BG, point with G, to B and A, uh, B and plus one A uh, for some N, which is the degree of our cohomology in some A. And now um, we can do the following to this. So we can first of all cyclify it or form the free loop space first. And I'm taking the liberty of just mapping just a smooth circle into it, but by the assumption that our group G is actually discrete, this turns out to be equivalent to homing BZ, the shape of the circle into it. I could have just written that um, it's, uh, it's the same in the situation where there's no geometry by assumption in this singularity. We've ignored the, the geometry for a moment just to zoom in on this bare fact. So this top line here is just um, this mapping stack construction applied to our co-cycle F as a functor. And we just observe well on the left by what I just said, this really just the inertia orbifold, um, the, the free loop orbifold, if you wish, of this discrete. Whereas on the right here, I'm now using the splitting, which I just uh, mentioned, and consider the projection onto this shifted factor. Remember, there was a factor that kind of remembered the actual loops, whereas the other factor was the base points. So we throw away the base point information and just re retain the loops. And now, by further functionality of our cyclification construction, we can form the homotopy quotients here by, by these S1 actions and form our cyclified, find our cyclified orbifolds. Again, we know it's a functor. So all of this commutes here. The square commutes just by functoriality of the homotopy quotient operation. We have the same splitting. This is this little ingredient that I showed in the previous slide. And we have this loop transgression, sorry, this loop integration operation, which I just mentioned. And the, this rejection diagram that I showed on the previous slide shows that, showed essentially equivalently that this triangle commutes. So we have these computing triangles and now the second theorem we prove in this article is that this composite here recovers the usual transgression formula uh, in group cohomology from group co-cycles to co-cycles on the inertia stack. Um, this formula has a long history. It's somehow implicit in Dijkraff Witten's original work on Dijkraff Witten theory. It was uh, highlighted very much uh, in what 2008 or something by Simon Willerton in his who called it the who called the proof. Yeah. Who, who, who also proved the multiple type of this um, inertia stack and called this the Parmesan theorem, uh, which which really is a is a variant. It turns out of the Eilenberg silver map. So as we as we prove that this abstract infinite topos theoretic construction recovers the traditional notion, one uses some old theorems. Eilenberg silver. I'm not going to show this here, but again, this is a this is um, a non-trivial but um, sort of straightforward. Uh, Labor, uh, laborious proof to show that this evident looping, con this evident construction gives a transgression. But then you see nicely by the commutativity of these squares that I just mentioned, we know that this actually descends to the cyclification 
And, and there we see that transgression now is just apply the simplification functor and use this uh, loop integration projection R to get out of the quotient, your actual code cycle. So this has some pleasant consequences now. Um, sorry, I, I keep having trouble scrolling here, but we'll manage. This has some pleasant um, consequences. But I guess before I come to them, let's see how much time do I have left. Oh yeah, I have 40, 50 minutes, right? So um, yeah, I wanna use that for something. So in my talk title, it had something about high energy physics. I do wanna explain briefly how all of this is related to um, brain charges and um, and specifically about kaluza klein double dimensional reduction in of brain charges. And uh, just, we need just one more uh, ingredient. Oh no, we have some light here. Uh, just one more ingredient. Um, to, to get there. So um, first I wanna highlight, yeah. So what I wanna do now is we, we wanna bring in some theory of principal bundles inside our infinite drop of which we call principal infinity bundles. And um, so it turns out uh, that's a very nice theory of principal bundles in infinity topoi, essentially almost the, the axioms that the Giro, Resc, or whatever axioms that uh, characterize Rotendieck infinity toposes are essentially exactly the axioms that you that you need in order to have a really good theory of principal bundles. In any case, um, it turns out on abstract grounds that, um, for instance, our cyclic cyclic loop stack construction is naturally um, or naturally the base of um, of a principal bundle. I'm shifting gears now here, and that I say um, we can actually do the previous construction for all kinds of loop objects in our infinite topos. It doesn't have to be just the circle. Um, the infinity topos machine knows how to do this in much more general generality so that I can allow myself to consider any group stack T here, any infinity stack with group operation. You may think of T as just being S1, in which case T is supposed to be a mnemonic for, for T1, for the, the circle regarded as the one-dimensional torus. And now just the fact that the cyclic stack is defined as being the homotopy quotient of something, namely of this mapping stack, uh, that fact alone means that this projection map into this quotient is a T principal bundle in the, in the right higher sense, which is classified by this canonical map that is classified by this code. So this kind of the churn, the first churn class of this infinity bundle. It is literally the first churn class uh, when, we, when T is S and when T is S1, And now here's the most curious fact, which actually becomes a triviality in the infinite topos perspective. And, but it's the most curious fact actually um, about these simplification operations, um, which, which really follow from just um, base, what's called base change uh, in infinite topos. But it says the following, it says, if we consider the category of T principal bundles in smooth infinity group, so these are really, T principal infinity bundles, think of circle bundles, but in the context of stacks, then there is of course two evident constructions of this. We can form the total space of any bundle, right? You take the, the top guy, we can form the base space, uh, in which case, uh, in, in our case here, these spaces are stacks, but, any, but they, we can still call them such. And now it turns out, um, which is something you would think should be super classical, but maybe wasn't appreciated for what it is for a long time. This total space construction has a right adjoint in the sense of a joint functors, meaning there is a kind of a best approximation to an inverse from the right here to it. And it's that construction that takes a smooth infinity group and takes it to a T principal bundle that turns out to be our simplification construction, or rather it's this, this bundle of free loops over mm -hmm. the simplification that it constructs. So it sends X to the free mapping stack over the simplification. So that then if you then form the base space of that bundle, you get the simplification. So simplification is actually a right adjoint to form total spaces out of T principal bundles and then just remember the base space. So that's really curious because it's so fundamental. Sorry, I jumped again here. Go back, oh yeah. And now we can use this. Sorry, here we go. So what does it mean to be a right adjoint? Uh, it's, gee, here we go. 
Uh, what does it mean to be a rally joint? There's, of course, several equivalent definitions of what a jointness means, but um, the, the main one, certainly for us here, is that if, if a functor L is rightly joined to functor R, it means that maps out of L of something are equivalent to maps out of that something into R of the original codomain. So it means you can take a left adjoint functor out of a home from the left to the right. So in our case, this means the following. Suppose we have um, a stack X here, a total space stack, and then we have some cohomology class in this generalized sense that I described at the beginning. So suppose we have some uh, modular infinity stack A that classifies in cohomology theory, which might just be B and A for ordinary cohomology. And suppose we have this cosecyclin X. Now suppose furthermore that X is actually has the structure of a fiber bundle. So it's actually the total space of a T, sorry, T principal bundle over some base. Well, then, um, then uh, this cocycle is really the map out of uh, the left adjoint of this adjunction. Remember, this adjunction says that forming total spaces, so forming X, taking X out of this fiber bundle, is right adjoint to forming cyclification. But that means that these cocycles out of X are actually in, I wanted to say, bijection. It's really they're equivalent to as in the infinity group of which they form. But for practical purposes, uh, the bijective two maps out of the space Y, now with coefficients not in A, but in the cyclification of A. And the curious thing here is that by the nature of adjunctions, this goes both ways. It, it says these maps are actually equivalent to these. So that the collection of these is equivalent to the collection of those. That means you can go back and forth. If you have a co-cycle here, it's coefficients and cyclifications, you can recover from it the principal bundle and the co-segment. I should say, which is of course indicated here, I should highlight this. So it's really an important subtlety. We'll come to this in more detail in just a moment, uh, maybe in concluding that um, That down here, since we're in the category of principal bundles, as we, as we, so this cosecle has to be regarded as being sliced over BT. If you forget this, the bijection no longer works. So I should really say, cosecles down here with coefficient and cyclification such that, or such that they're equipped with this equivalence between the, the classifying map for the principal bundle that we start with, and this induced classifying map that comes from the fact that SUC itself is a principal bundle. That has to be equal. So, so as we apply this general, so this is completely general here for any A, any X, any T. As we apply this now to the simple cases, but important cases that we, that we started with and that many people care about, where T is S, a calligraphic A is uh, this einbach Lane space, then we have an ordinary N plus one cos cycle on our total space of an S1 principal bundle. And we um, extract from it the cyclified co-cycle and integrate out from this the corresponding co-cycle in degree lower. You see, this is now an operation that is also rather familiar. What, what this actually does as one analyzes, this is a fiber integration of co-cycle. This means I have a co-cycle on an S1 fiber bundle. And so I can ask for integrating these co-cycles over these fibers. And this is what this construction does. So this is of key importance in uh, in physics, it's particularly in string theory where uh, kind of these point particles of higher degrees appear because there it models what's called double dimensional reduction of charges. So, so the same situation that I just said before um, in physics can be interpreted or is a model for the situation where you ask on some space time x to have a certain uh, integer uh, charge hidden. And you wanna ask, well, if that space time is itself a circle bundle over some base, does this imply any charges downstairs? Um, the, the original example actually of this doesn't come from string theory. This is something uh, rooted in, in uh, observed physics. This goes back to Dirac's um, analysis of electric magnetic charge quantization. He envisioned um, a Minkowski space time, so just flat space that we inhabit. But he said, what if, what if, what if a magnetic monopole were to exist? So he imagined there is a a little point charge with a point magnetic charge. And due to singularities, this induces, he said, well, let's take that out of the space time and consider a space time which has a hole in, inside it. So we take out a ball um, in which that monopole might have been sitting. And then it turns out that resulting space time has non trivial um, cohomology, integral cohomology in degree two, reflecting the fact that we have this two sphere around 
the removed monopole. And Dirac was the first to say, well, that cohomology, the cohomology class of this space time, which is somewhat the equivalent to just this two, can be understood as the number or the charge number of that magnetic charge carried by this monopole. Yeah, and so in theories like string theory, this uh, argument, exactly this argument, just generalizes now to other dimensions of both space time and of these brains. And I've just briefly sketched here, but I don't think we have time to really talk about any details here. Um, the important examples of the five brains in 11D uh, reducing to, to N as five brains in 10D. So that is uh, covered by this general machinery. And maybe, so I think I have five minutes left. I have a bit more here to say, but I, I do just want to end on on this important point here, which uh, not just drops out uh, effortlessly, but which is actually rather deep. Um, so it's a bit of a complicated looking diagram, but let me just explain it briefly. It's really simple. It's just the previous diagrams, but you kind of, um, you know, two copies of them glued together. Maybe I want to highlight the this issue that cyclification a priori lends, you know, that the cyclified space a priori is fibered over BT or BS1, then we can forget this vibration. So it can happen. So the adjunction told us that if we if we do remember the cyclified space, I maybe dare to jump back, that this was this point here. If we do remember that the cyclified space is fibered over BT or BS, then as such, morphisms of vibrations here maps of vibrations are just equivalent to those upstairs. So if any, this means if any two of them down here are equivalent S maps sliced over BT, then they must have been equivalent up here. But this changes as we forget the slicing. It can happen that two such co-cycles here become equivalent if only we allow them to not necessarily, the equivalence to not respect the slicing. So this is what this diagram is meant to indicate here. Suppose, Suppose you have two coefficients a and b to infinity stacks, whose cyclification happens to be equivalent just as plain stacks, not as stacks fibered over bt. Then, if we have the base of a t principal bundle and map into these, then there is now two ways to oxidize back to, uh, right? We can think of this as being a cyclic co cycle on y. And we know from the previous discussion that cyclic co-cycles on Y actually equivalent to non-cyclic co-cycles um, up on some T principal bundle over Y. But now we have a choice because these are equivalent here uh, without the vibration. We can say, well, okay, let's suppose we regard this cyclic co-cycle as being fibered with the corresponding projection map of A. This is what I call C1A here, right? So this cyclic space comes with this projection map to BT. This composite produces as a map from, a, from Y to BT. This classifies a T principal bundle. And so we know by the previous adjunction that if we form that principal bundle, then our co cycle tilde F corresponds to some co cycle FA up here, an A co cycle on this T principal bundle. But interestingly, we can just as well say, well, under this equivalence here, let me consider this other projection. So this should be came with another projection, and I can uh, form the corresponding co cycle here and form another T principal bundle. And then the adjunction tells me that there is another co-cycle here. That co-cycle need not be the same as FA. In fact, they in general will be incomparable even because A and B themselves may not actually be equivalent, just as cyclification were. So there's no way to even ask what it would mean for FA to equal FB. These are different things. And yet it can happen that after cyclification and forgetting that slicing, they become essentially the same thing. And uh, so when that happens, there's a curious duality in the physics sense, so a curious um, relation between these co-cycles on this principal bundle and this co-cycle on this principal bundle. And um, yeah, when we, when we started to realize that we have these adjunctions here that I'm talking about, it was really this situation that, that we were looking at. We noticed that, we noticed that if one looks at this situation, in, in super rational homotopy theory. So, um, well, that's just because this is the, the situation which we could control. I'm sorry, I have trouble here with that. Okay, we control. So we know that this setup, if, um, if A and B are the super rationalization, like in, in the sense of super geometry, super rational homotopy theory, of the twisted K theory spectrum and it's, so the K theory spectrum, the class, or the, the bundle of spectra that classifies um, 
twisted KU0 and the bundle of spectra that classifies as twisted KU1, then such a situation holds and reflects exactly the t-duality between the topological t-duality between uh, K0 on, uh, on one uh, uh, um, circle bundle and on the other. So we think, but this is just an announcement here, that this is, this is actually the fully general concept in the context of t-duality, topological t-duality. Whether or not it is, it certainly exists as this construction of, which follows just from the simplification. So I think I'm out of time now. Um, I do want to, if, if I have just one minute, maybe, allow me just to end on this note, which I mentioned in our conversation uh, yesterday, which is kind of the, the little exercise we maybe, or the little question we want to pose to, to the community or to you. Um, the, here's the following is something we would like to know. So in applications to string theory, we're interested in such closed cycles on a space-time X, which take values in the four sphere, in some twisted version of the four sphere. We have this hypothesis for which we accumulated some evidence that the actual charges of the five brain. So from a previous slide, we knew that the, the five brain, what physicists call the five brain on 11 dimensional space-time has this charge in underlying and a charge in, in ordinary four cohomology. So we claim that this charge actually has to be understood as being just the characteristic class of a co-cycle that actually takes values in maps to the sphere module or something. And as we simplify this, as we ask what this looks like down in, in lower dimensions, we get this situation. So suppose our 11 dimensional space time, as one usually supposes, is a circle bundle over some other orbifold, which would be called the type two space time orbifold. Now we're, we're claiming that the, the four class that uh, is the five brain charge on here actually comes from this map to the four sphere, to a, to a quotient by the, of the four sphere. Now, as we simplify, and restrict attention to the almost constant loops, which has a very neat physics interpretation. It's, it's really this perturbative limit where the M-theory circle is small. We, we find that down in 10D, that hypothesis H about our m brain charges says that we have a co-cycle with coefficients in uh, Zenuan's extended inertia group board of this orbifold. So it, it somehow says that the real nature of m brain charges in, a, in certain limits here are really given by maps to this extended inertia orbifold of specifically ADE quotients, if you wish, of the four sphere, namely G. I don't think my slide actually says it here, but G should be a finite subgroup of SU2. And this action uh, on S4 should be the one that comes by thinking of S4 as being the unit sphere in R plus H, a copy of the quaternions act on this with E. And so since this now is a natural domain for quasi-elliptic cohomology, it would mean that if you have any co-cycle on here in quasi-elliptic cohomology, twisted equivariant, it would kind of be a way to detect these M-brain charges. You could say, well, the actual M-brain charge is this here, this map, but it's, it's maybe too complicated for us to understand. So let's post-compose it with the co-cycle in quasi-elliptic cohomology, which in my funny notation, I just denote by a map to you can ignore this here. This is our notation for twisted equivalent K-theory. So, so the question is just what is, and I'll end on this note, what is actually the quasi-elliptic twisted equivalent cohomology of ADE quotients of the four sphere? I would really like to know this. If we have an answer for this, there might be some uh, fun consequences for physics. On that note, I end. I apologize for going over time a little, and I'm happy to take questions. Any questions for the speaker? I have maybe a very stupid question, potentially, but uh, hey, of course, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I was just curious. Um, in the <clears throat> when you define the uh, simplified uh, the simplification construction, you uh, use a shape map which sends uh, a circle to be Z, and that uh, sort of in terms of principle Z bundles picks picks a. a uh, cohomology class, uh, the non-trivial cohomology class, right, for uh, the circle the, in the integer yes. cohomology. Um, would anything change if you pick the the other, so to say, generator for the cohomology group? You mean if I, 
what is the other generator? You mean minus? Well, so, you, so this this map picks a cohomology class, as a first integer cohomology class of S one, right? Yes. Um, what would happen to the construction? Would something interesting happen if you picked a different class? I see. I see. So you want to take minus that class here, or maybe uh -huh. even some multiple? Um, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Um, so certainly. Um, certainly that pullback construction here can be done for any map. So if you wish, right, you can take this inertia over fold or simplified inertia over fold and, and extend it. This is really what this extends, but you want to, you want to somehow say, let, let there be a circle action. You can take this here to be by any map, really. That's true. Yeah. You could take, you could take any map here. You would get this pullback. It would have the same form. Now the S1 action would be different. It would be acting via this multiple. And so, yeah, so this would be some some new thing. You can certainly define it. Um, I don't know what it would be good for. I th yeah, I think, so does it work. I think if we just take minus the class, it should come out as being equivalent um, to the original one. We'd have to think about this. If it's, uh, if it's a non-unit class, then it will be different mm -hmm. and uh, have some weird meaning. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, one can consider this, but I'm not sure what to say about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I should say, though, that um, related to this, this comparison map really uses, uh, let me think about this. I was going to say it really uses that we, we are specifically using the unit. Um, so so this comparison map really comes from um, from understanding that the cyclification is really the right base change of um, along the point inclusion into BS1, whereas this here is the right base change along the point inclusion. So exiting over the point, your right base change it to BZ. And so this guy, so this is how this is constructed. This guy and this guy are related by the fact that if you take this and further right base change along the junction unit, I mean, along the shape unit, then you get this. And so by going back and forth, pushing forward, pulling back, there's a unit map, which gives this dashed arrow here. Mm -hmm. So um, so what does that imply to it for your question? Um, well, I guess if actually, if you do all of this at all stages with some multiple of the shape, it will still work. You will get, yeah, you will get this here with some n-fold action this year and the comparison. Yeah, so I guess it still works. I'm not sure what it means, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Any other questions for the speaker? Mm. Yeah, I should say again, this, this is a joint article I'm finalizing with Hisham Sati. We hope to have this out soon. It's on, the, the draft is on the webpage, if anybody wants to see it. Okay, so if there's no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.